Welcome to episode three of the Seneca College Creative Advertising Program Series Ad TLC, where we're all about thinking, learning, and connecting. These webcasts have been part of the Creative Advertising Program's year-end celebration of future young, inspired, and motivated Adlanders. This will all coincide and end on April 29th with Ad Day at our Markham campus. That day, we will be hosting two keynote speakers, creative director and developer and voice of adteachings.com, Suzanne Pope, and Leslie M. of Combustion. Leslie is an uber-talented training professional who has helped agencies and companies how to deliver creative creativity to, in a much smarter, faster, and more developed way to answer business challenges. Follow the link that we will be tweeting out tonight to register for Ad Day on April 29th. We have an amazing time bringing you this series, which we are planning to continue in the future. So also be sure to follow, the twi also follow us on Twitter for updates. Throughout the live feed, please tweet in any questions that you may have by using the hashtag AdTLC. We have Matt Lee in the studio following the feed, and we will go to him for some updates from time to time. For the next 60 minutes, and probably a little like, likely to go a little bit longer tonight, we're privileged to have an awesome guest with us. This episode will feature a true creative juggernaut, the CEO, the Chief Creative Officer of Leo Burnett Toronto, Judy John. Judy began her career as a copywriter, honing her skills at small independent shops, large multinationals, and even running her own company. Judy joined Leo Burnett Toronto in 1999 as Chief Creative Officer, and in March 2011, she added the title of CEO to her name. Under Judy's direction, Leo Burnett Toronto has not only won global recognition at every major award show for its work, but has also established a model that is truly driven by solving client problems with strong sound creativity that has not only changed, but has defined advertising communication. Award highlights include the first ever D and AD black pencil in, digital, in the digital category, and also becoming the most awarded Canadian agency at the One Show in 2011 and 2012. The agency has also won the Advertising Design Club of Canada's inaugural Scarlet Letter Awards as both Advertising Agency of the Year in 2011 and the Design Agency of the Year in 2012. I've been preaching the good gospel of the great creative inspiration that's been coming out of Leo Burnett to my students for quite a while. The first class that I ever meet students, I actually give them one of the Leo Burnett Big Black Pencils. Leo's inspiration to all creatives. It is the one that he used himself, one where he felt big ideas come from big pencils. The pencil contains no eraser because no idea should ever be left behind or lost in the translation. Please welcome Judy to Add TLC. That was a mouthful. I should have done that, that off the cuff well, instead thank of. You. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so let's start uh, out with the you know the obvious first question. How did you find yourself getting into this business, and what was the moment that you really felt that <laughs> this was for you? Um, well, I think it happened at a couple different times, uh, and um, I, I don't think many people know this story. But in in high school, I ran for student council, and I was the publicity director so we had the advertising uh, we had to do all the ads for the school dances and bake sales and things like that and uh, I ran for student council mostly because I wanted to get out of class but um, <laughs> it also provided an opportunity to I had a small staff of I think four or six people and we made posters and and things like that and um, you know it was it was interesting it wasn't what I ended up studying in university um, my first couple of years I studied film and theater. And then, I don't know, there was something in the back of my mind that I wanted to get into advertising. So um, after two years of university, I dropped out and went to college. And what, what so what was it about that drew you to advertising? I mean, obviously the high school part, but like um, that moment in university. You where know what, I love television. So I spent a lot of time watching TV and um, I did my homework in front of TV. I ate in front of TV. I still call television the friend. Like when I get home, I might spend some time with the friend. Um, so I have a really fond attachment with uh, television. So when you were going through this, uh, 
stage of developing and going into advertising. Did you have a mentor that sort of helped you, guide you towards your career or towards becoming the writer? And um, I think I had many different uh, mentors over the years. And, uh, you know, I was really lucky early on to do my internship at Shiat Day. And Shiat Day at the time was the hottest agency in the country. I think they won Agency of the Year two years in a row. And um, there were some amazing copywriters. And, and you know, the person who gave me my internship uh, is Joe Alexander. And he's the creative director at Martin Agency. Um, and he is, he's so good. He's just genius and his writing is, it's so insightful and so inspired. And I remember watching him photocopy his portfolio in, in the copy room and it was just like one genius ad after another. And, you know, headlines that aren't puns but are really just, just great insight. Right. And that's where it started. So was there um, any piece of advice that somebody gave you that helped you even get you know, to break in faster or to break in to the right place? Um, yeah, there was, there was a team that took me under their wing at uh, Shy Day, uh, Jeff Odiorn and Steve St. Clair, and they, you know, a couple pieces of, of advice for me was work on your book. Like we just, he said, you're gonna write about 100 ads and you're gonna show your book around and you're gonna take out 99 of them and you're gonna, you're gonna keep one and then you're gonna do another 100. And it's the sheer volume of it where you're really crafting your skill, but also, he said, be a student of life. Like, look around, be aware, look at what, you know, what people are doing and why they're doing those things. And those are the insights that you draw from. Draw from the human around you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in my intro, I certainly defined, uh, you know, Leo Burnett's success now as being creative driven. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how that process came about? Like, you were being brought in as uh, chief creative officer and bringing that voice, because for the longest time, the multinationals, the Leo Burnett's, the BBDO's, the DDB's, they kind of sat, you know, creative is what we delivered to our clients, but it was really pushed by billings and, and strategy research and that. But the creative that's coming out of Leo is like the drive there. So can you talk to that? Yeah, I, I think that uh, Burnett has always been a creative agency. Um, and, you know, even before I got there, when Elsbeth and Lorraine and Jeff Finkler and, the, you know, there's some really great work that came out of there for Fruit of the Loom and Special K, and there were some really great, great things that happened. So um, there was, you know, there's already a desire that uh, they want creativity, and it is what, um, it's what we do. Um, I think that it's a lot of what I bring to Burnett is based on my experience. I spent a lot of time in small agencies, you know, worked at, um, at Taxi when there was seven people and at uh, Jeffrey Roche and Partners at the time. And it's that small agency that I really gravitate to because I really love the hands-on and everybody jumps in, everybody helps out. And then I've also worked at big agencies. I've worked at BBDO and Ogilvy. And, you know, there's a great thing within large agencies, which is process, you know, it isn't, it's not the wild west, it isn't like, oh, it's chaos, there's, it's, it's more process driven. So what I've tried to do at Burnett is bring those two worlds together of um, hands on, everybody in, like if we got a problem to solve, you just go grab the right people in the hallway, or we assign the right team of people to that. And it's all, it's just working together. And, um, but with, with good process and, you know, that's so, how we do it. Can you talk about your own creative process? Like, how do you solve problems? Like, what do you, like, is there, is there, yeah, I know it's a, it's probably one of the toughest questions we may ask tonight. Like, you know, how do you approach ideas? What, what's the first thing, you know, you get that brief and you have to, you, you establish that brief. I spend a lot of time on the brief. It's, it's the key, like the, the strategy um, leads you down certain paths. So you, strategy has to be really clear. And sometimes uh, people say, oh, we like our strategy really broad and leave it wide open. And I say, that's terrible. It's like, I call that wandering around in the forest looking for the unicorn. Like when the, when the brief is too big, we send the creatives off and they're just like, I don't know, it could be this, it's this, it's this and this, and there's no point of view. The best strategy leads you to a point, and usually when I'm reading the strategy, I can see what the solution kind of looks like. And if you, can re if you read the brief and you have no idea what you're doing, that's when you know the brief's gotta go back. Right. Um, so it really starts there. And then um, 
And then I just go, you know, it's, it's, I read magazines or I'll start looking at reference or I'll look at annuals of, I like to ground myself in what's been done in this category. So, you know, where are other, um, where are the competitors going? What kind of insights have they tapped into? Just to, is for inspiration, but also to keep me away from there. Right. Um, because, you know, as creatives, we always want to do something new and right. fresh. Um, and then, you know, I'll go for a walk, I'll talk to people who are, you know, if whatever I'm working on, I'll, if I see you drinking smart water, I'll go, why do you drink that? What's, so what's good about it? So I do a lot of, I just talk to people who are into that thing and right. it's the curiosity. Yeah. Well, that, and I love that because one of the things that I preach is that you've got to be, you have to have an insatiable curiosity yeah. for the success in this business. I mean, it's rooted mm -hmm. in that. There's, there's never a moment that you're not looking at something and asking why. Yeah. You know, that's a beauty part. Um, one of the things I've heard about, um, you know, one of your key pushes um, at, at Burnett. <laughs> Might be a lie. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's come down a couple of times now. Okay. That you really kind of push the ideas to be about acts, not ads. Mm -hmm. That, you know, yeah. so can you explain that a bit and, uh, you know, to get your creative teams to buy into that? Acts, not ads, it's more about, um, creating a two-way conversation and that's the way av advertising should be anyway it, it isn't it's not the old school where we're just pushing out a message and saying here here it is um, the act part is involving people in our conversation it's it's making sure that they're interested in it so even when we get um, a simple brief for outdoor you know James Reddy is a great example do some billboards and say you know buy our beer for example um, well, you, you can do that, but the interesting thing is how do you get people to really care? And that's, that's the, the acts part. How do we get them to engage with us and have a conversation with us or look us up or recommend us to a friend? And that's the point of view we try to take on pretty much everything we do. And so it's very easy for the creatives to then start to think beyond just a push, like yeah. a simple idea. Be yeah, beyond us selling something. Yeah. Um, Many of the pieces that uh, you know Burnett works on, and certainly from your end, are really strongly based in a good story. Like mm -hmm. there seems to be a great story behind everything. Yeah. So, how does somebody develop strong storytelling <laughs> skills? Is there like, you know, like the, we, our audience is obviously going to be student based, or at mm -hmm. least that's you know how we're selling this. So, you know, th th that's a million dollar question as well. But. Yeah, it's funny because we were talking about that at work today where, um, you know, sometimes we'll see an idea and we'll say, you know, there's the beginning of an idea there. And then we'll push on it about how to execute it and things like that. And then, the, and then depending on the team, they'll go away. One team will go away and bring back exactly what they think you asked for. And they'll say, here it is. And they'll think those, they'll solved it. And to a certain extent, they have. But when you look at it, you're not, you don't feel anything. And, and I think there is a, I guess that's what makes it subjective, creativity subjective. But I think you should feel something. It isn't just that you've intellectually solved it. It's like one plus one equals two. Um, the really great teams take your feedback and go in unexpected ways, but it's the insight that they bring to it. It's the, why do I care? Or, wow, you've made me think about that product or, that insight in a very different way. And that's the storytelling. Um, you can see when creatives come, you know, when they write headlines, for example, they come up with ads and it's their first idea because everybody would have gone there. Right. You know, that's you know obvious. it, you know it, the obvious. And you go, yeah, you know, it's not wrong. It's hard to argue because you go, that's not wrong, but it's not good. Yeah. And it's that push for a deeper insight or something that no one has come up with. That's the genius. Yeah. And you know, it's rare, but that's what we aspire Strive to. Yeah, yeah. That's our, our lead. Um, I was privileged to hear you speak at uh, Advertising Week Toronto this uh, past February uh, at the leading social change uh, conversation mm -hmm. uh, on how we could do work that matters. So I want to take a look at a couple of campaigns that uh, Burnett's done for raising the roof. And sure. the first one we're going to take a look at is called Stickers. Okay. Raising the Roof is a homeless awareness organization. Every winter for the past 16 years, they've sold winter hats to raise money. While people know about the hats, they wonder if the money is actually making a difference. In 2013, we addressed the concern 
by marking places where money from raising the roof hats have helped the homeless get off the street. Bright and celebratory messages started popping up in unexpected spots across the city. Spots where people usually see the homeless. In doorways, this message appeared. Super job! There's no scared homeless teens sleeping in this doorway, thanks to those who bought Raising the Roof hats. Buy yours and help the homeless. By sidewalks. Great work! There's one less homeless woman begging for money on this street, thanks to those who bought Raising the Roof hats. And other location specific messages in stairwells, on garbage bins, park benches, and in buildings, bus shelters, and alleyways. Marking the points where hat sales have helped the homeless get off the street showed people that every hat sold does add up to major change. The 2013 goal was to sell 40,000 hats. We met that goal with nine months remaining. Raising the Roof Street Posters Thanking those who helped the homeless. The results speak for themselves, uh, the success and, and, and the numbers that are quoted in that. What was the brief and the, and the core of the strategy behind that, that you took to your creatives? Well, the whole brief is, is you know, we do this, this hat campaign every year, and it is to, um, how do you make people care? You know, there are, and it, it's hard for every, or every organization is, we're all fighting for the same dollar. People only allocate so much money to causes. And how do you make them care about your cause? And you know, one of the insights we always find is people, for every cause, they don't know where the money goes or does their money really work? And I think um, you know, that's definitely one of the concerns when people support something like raise, raising the roof. You know, does my money really work? Um, you want to make sure that you're making a difference. And so part of the campaign was doing that. And the stickers certainly spoke to like, Somebody got a job that was once sitting here yeah. and all that. Mm -hmm. and right. how did the public respond to those pieces? I mean, they were stuck down and, you know, did they read them? Did you, did you have a chance to observe um, individual um, opinion on that? Was there? No, we, we, well, I don't know. We haven't asked around about that, but uh, usually you do see, like, even when we're putting them up, they're so, you know, they really pop out. People read them, you know, they'll stop. Like, I would stop and look at that and go, huh, you know, and the whole thing is about changing the perception. Right. Um, does budget impact the choice of media when you work on something like this? Of course. Always does. Yeah, of course. But, <laughs> um, but in this case, because you are doing this for raising the roof, and mm -hmm. so the less that they can, the more they can give, then. Oh, for sure. Yeah. We, you know, definitely we try to keep our, um, we try to be really respectful of the budget. It, it doesn't make sense to to um, spend a lot of money on production when you, you know I get why why you have to at times to break through, um, but you know the pure creativity is how do you do it for a tiny budget? And you know, should agent this is something that we have our students do as part of our program. Um, we ask them to find a corporate um, sponsor. Mm -hmm. um, and then pick a cause that is relevant to the Canadian public. And, you know, like for an example, we would have chapters potentially um, underwriting a campaign for mothers uh, to learn how to read, mm -hmm. immigrant mothers to learn how right. to read. Yeah. Um, should agencies work with their clients to start to develop more social change uh, type messages, like set aside a portion of their uh, Add budgets annually to make a social change. I know that P and G did some things with Pampers, mm -hmm. um, where there's a buyback on purchase and that. Yeah, I, I think a lot of, um, I know a lot, most of our clients already do that. Right. Um, you might not hear about them because some of that is in in the background, but I, I think that a lot of companies are doing that. But to come out with a campaign that would be a very large, loud voice. Um, or is it that they prefer to stay back? On it that? depends on the strategy. Right. It depends on their involvement with that charity. Um, yeah, it's it's different levels of how much they want the the public to know, and sometimes that seems self-serving, right? And sometimes it doesn't. It depends on the relationship and the public. If they see it as self-serving, yeah, then yeah, exactly, can bite back yeah, on you. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, we're going to look at another raising the roof piece um, that again was uh, to show how they could get more out of their contribution and learn mm -hmm. where their contribution gets. So let's take a look at uh, the hat wall. Okay. 
Raising the Roof is a charity focused on creating homelessness awareness. For 16 years, they've raised donation money by selling toques, Canadian for winter hat. The biggest barrier stopping people from buying a hat was not the $10 price tag, but the fact that they were unsure exactly where the money goes, how it is used, and who it will help. And above this, hats just don't evoke emotional connections. In 2014, for hat sales to reach the necessary level, we repackaged them and gave them a purpose. This hat will help a homeless woman find a job. This hat will help a homeless man eat tonight. This hat will help connect a homeless teen with a mentor. And more. Now people weren't buying hats, they were buying solutions. An outdoor store was then set up in one of the city's busiest areas. There, people could buy a hat that represents a purpose they connect with. Turning buy a hat into buy a shower, second chance, warm bed, or safe place for a homeless person to sleep helped Raising the Roof reach their 2013 sales goal of 40,000 hats nine months early. Repackaging Letting people know every hat does make a difference. So I love the simplicity of the design. I mean, the package and the typography and the display in it and that. Um, so I want to talk to you about two things, is mm -hmm. the, the success and result of being able to now sell directly, because really a lot of it was driven to the website, you order your hat and you yes, got it back. Right. Yeah. But this was more like hands-on, so I want you to talk to that. But I also want to get into the a bit of a conversation on the idea of how important design is today in this communication process, like graphic design and, and that, um, the visual side. Right. Um, first question, uh, yes, it was, you know, we for the launch of the hat campaign, the uh, two campaign, they were, uh, our clients said, oh, you know, we got this, we secured some space at uh, Dundas Square, and we're going to sell some hats there. And we thought, that's amazing, you know, if you can do something down at Dundas Square and the traffic you get and the exposure you can get, we should do something really, um, uh, really striking there. And uh, the guys came up with this idea because, you know, we said, how do you create something that you know, it, w it was going to be just a little booth, a little tent, and you know, hey, do you want to buy a hat? It's like, how do you create something where people will actually stop and engage with it and, and then buy the hat? And you know, we started talking about, you know, a lot of people might not buy a hat, I need a hat, uh, I don't know if I'm gonna buy a hat. Um, we're not just selling the hat, and that's what repackaging help was really great at, it really created context of, this is what you're really buying. You're not really buying a hat, you're buying a shower for a homeless person. You're, you know, you're helping them in this way. And it really brought a context to what the hat stands for. And that, I thought that was really, really smart. Yeah, and it was striking visuals. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. was just like, it, mm -hmm. like it, it, it would stop you. And, yeah. and the package yeah. really looked uh, inviting. Yeah. So that goes into that side of now graphic mm -hmm. design, like sure. being named, you know, design firm, you know, agency yeah, of the that year. That was but, amazing. Yeah, yeah. so, was, you know, you were saying earlier when we, before the show um, that how large your department is and how, as an agency, you're one of the biggest in Canada as far as design or taking that on. Yeah, yeah, I think we have one of the biggest design uh, groups within a, I'll say, traditional agency, even though we're non-traditional. Um, we have a, a really large design department. And when I first started at Burnett, I wanted to, br I, you know, I thought, Design is the future, and you could start to see that, um, you know, design was just becoming a bigger thing in furniture, and people were talking about it, and um, there was a lot of emphasis there, and it looked like that's where everything was going to go. It's taken a long time to, to build up that um, that that uh, discipline within our agency, and you know, you got to get your clients on board and things like that. Um, but it is so important to what we do, and you can see it in our work. When you see our work across the board, there is a consistency of um, the art direction and the design of everything, that there's a reason for everything. Um, with the, I, I talk about the marriage of art and copy all the time. And if we're driving both copy and, and the art, just as hard to tell a story, and they're both crafted, we craft the crap out of everything. Um, it's going to be an incredible story and it's going to be a striking story because design is what stops you. Yeah. And then the words is the, the storytelling part and together they're just, 
they're an incredible combination. Yeah, it's where the magic happens. Yeah. Um, and so that, you know, the art director, you know, when you're looking at art directors, the, the amount of design and craft in their books is probably really right at the top of your list when, yes. you're, mm -hmm. when you're reviewing books yeah. like that. Um, I love a piece that um, I wanted to just show, you know, uh, during the broadcast, because this this you know stopped me dead in my tracks. You know, such an intelligent solve, you mm -hmm. know, creates a social change. It gets people talking about a, a subject. Um, this was done by the uh, Miami Ad School in Brooklyn and their teacher Graham Douglas. So they came up with this idea of a package of band aids that actually included a bone marrow kit. Um, you know, you're going to cut your fingers. So there's blood. Uh, one of the best ways to uh, test you and to find your match or to provide your name into the registry is blood. And in, inside was actually the kit. And I think we have a couple of close-up photos that we can show um, what is actually inside the package. I think they cue that up in the room. Um, but do you see clients potentially engaging their own brands into this type of thing? So like if you had a client and there was a nice way to connect them um, to yeah. get a client to buy into something like that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we're always trying to connect our clients. And, and you know, when a really smart idea comes up like that, um, you know, and it makes sense for both parties, it's like, why not? Okay. Um, earlier we had a uh, comment tweeted into us uh, from some young talent uh, who are building their portfolios, especially this time of year there. <laughs> yeah, there's you know, a lot of portfolios. There's a lot of portfolios coming out. Yeah. Um, so they're, you know, running around trying to figure uh, execution, tactic, what's the best media. Is it better to start off truly media agnostic and get mm -hmm. that big idea on paper? Yeah, yeah. It, it is, it's all about ideas, really. And, um, you know, I, we were talking earlier about uh, every creative director will tell you something different about what you should have in your book. And so it becomes very confusing for, um, for, for people just coming out of school because it's like who do you listen to somebody says well where's radio you should have radio in your book or you should have tv in your book and and um you know i think i always think that you should you know out of all the advice you get you pick the agencies that you respect and the type of work that you want to do and that's the opinion you should take because you'll get a hundred different opinions on what should go in your book um you know i, I personally look for just really great ideas and um, the, the simplest thing is print ads. It's this, you know, it's the easiest way to telegraph whether you get it or not. Right. So a couple print ads is like staple. And from a, for a copywriter, I want to see you write. I made this mistake once for a copywriter. You know, beautiful book, visuals, and then a tiny line. But you know, nice visual solves and a tiny line. And we brought him in, and he couldn't write. He couldn't write a paragraph. And I thought, oh, I'm never going to do that again. So for writers, I want to see some writing in your book, some long copy. Um, and then we want to see, you know, at Burnett, we want to see some, some experiential stuff, like stuff on the street, you know, stuff that draws people in. Uh, digital is big right now. Right. And we think everybody should have, you know, you might not be an expert in digital, we don't expect that, but a curiosity in it or an understanding of what happens in that space. And what you can do with that space. Yeah, because yeah, we're going to talk about that, I think, on the next uh, piece. But one of the things is uh, social media and personal engagement. Uh, to, to, like, how does, you know, that's playing a larger role in the, pe in the picture. Do you mm -hmm. expect writers in their books to also demonstrate the ability to communicate in social media? Like, write that 140 character tweet, be effectively, you know, writing good community management. Would you like to see that in a writer's book? I don't need to see it. I think that, but you know, again, someone else will want to see it. And, right. and you know, if you can demonstrate in your book that you can write, I guarantee I can get you to write 140 characters for sure. But you know, that might be a way to break through is to do your entire book via tweets. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's never been done. We always look for stuff that's never been done. Right. So that could be really cool. So I wouldn't discount it. But it, you shouldn't hang your hat on it. Yeah, I, you know, I, yeah, yeah. there's a, there a great resume uh, that was uh, a girl when Vine came out um, and sort of started making noise in, you know, about a month ago or so, mm -hmm. and she did her entire resume in six seconds. Right. It was amazing. Yeah. And, you know, like, and, and she got picked up. Like somebody said, sure, yeah, you know, like, what? You, nobody, could else, nobody else did it. You mm -hmm. did it. So yeah. there's a proof. Um, we're going to move on to one of, uh, you know, one of your award-winning clients. Uh, you've done some amazing work for James Reddy. And... Uh, it seems to have this unmatched fa fan base. Uh, so we're gonna look first at uh, a James Reddy uh, piece that's the uh, coaster swap. Mm -hmm. 
or it's the coaster piece. Coaster. Yeah. Yeah. James Reddy is the beer of the people, always trying to give drinkers more for their money. Because of its growing popularity, James Reddy started getting listings in bars. In the overly beer branded bar environment, the only way our small brand could get noticed was through beer coasters. But beer coaster with more awesome. 50% more awesome. Coaster designs were oversized to give drinkers 50% more awesome in the form of entertainment, games, and information guys needed to make everything more awesome. Some coasters allowed drinkers to save their beer if they had to step out. Some allowed guys to save their butts with greeting cards. Cards for their girlfriends and or wives that said, Where was I last night? Your rhetorical questions are so cute. Or cards for co-workers that said, Sorry you found out we went to the bar without you. Next time, we'll try to be more secretive. Some taught drinkers things like magic tricks and wilderness survival. Some helped drinkers pass the time with bar games like penny hockey or guy Q tests. Some gave conversation starters and conversation enders or beer rain checks so buddies wouldn't forget to pay you back a beer. All the coasters were perforated, so the 50% awesomer could be collected, saved, and traded. James Reddy 50% awesomer beer coasters, helping JR stand out in the bar, helping get JR's personality in the hands of new drinkers, helping drinkers get more awesome for their beer dollar. So this is a great relationship with James Reddy. So where did this idea grow from and how do you keep it fresh? Like everything just each time, it's just like a new innovation, you know, whether it was, you know, buying yeah. a piece of the billboard. It's hard. It, it you know, the bar is really high on James Reddy. So um, we go through a lot of ideas. And, um, you know, this idea, they were, James Reddy was going on premise uh, and they wanted to, um, you know, get the word out to when you're at the bar, order James Reddy beer. And of course we have like small budgets and we don't, you know, we're not Budweiser and we don't get to buy a big thing and, you know, all these giveaways and things like that. Um, so the guys came up with this idea to do beer coasters, but let's, Let's do it in a James Reddy way because our whole thing is about, you know, the beer of the people and giving people more. Like, you know, expect more from us. And so, you know, it's just a really fun idea and apparently it was really successful. Oh, I can see yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. You know, clients are already saying, what, what, what else can we do? Yeah, and I love the, you know, put the little reserve tab on and yeah. the hockey, you know, the yeah. table hockey thing. It's just uh, you fun. Know, it, it, and it's again a great story that the the fans of the brand are, mm -hmm. are, are willing to participate in. Um, yes. We're going to also take a look at one more piece, um, which is the Facebook swap. Mm -hmm. James Reddy is the beer of the people, always giving more for their beer dollar. In 2012, with Facebook being JR's only communication space, JR wanted to attract new drinkers to the brand's page. Here we could introduce them to JR, new brews, and other news. So we turned to our loyal fans on Facebook, asking them to help us spread the word. On November 21st, we kicked off the James Reddy cover photo swap. It was simple. James Reddy drinkers could use JR's cover photo space if they let us use theirs. It started with a message in our cover photo. We'll give you this space if you give us yours. And the swapping began daily. We talked to Dave's hundreds of fans on his page. Hey friends of Dave. What has a handlebar, isn't a bike, and lives on Dave's face? The answer is on the James Reddy Beer Facebook page. And hundreds of Dave's friends went to see JR's page to see Dave ask others to donate to his Movember mustache. The next day, we talked to John's friends and teased them with a never before seen photo from his wedding. His friends came to our page to see the photo of his drunk bride. The following day, Jeremy gave us his page and we gave him ours. The next day, Adam swapped with us, and so on. We talked to thousands of new drinkers through their friend's cover photo. JR became endorsed by somebody they liked. Drinkers used JR's cover photo space to talk to JR fans and promote business, spread the word about their bands or concerts, post resumes, sell things, show off their art, 
press ladies, and endorsed their motorcycle gang and other odd reasons. Our message not only appeared on the JR fans page, but also in the newsfeed of all his friends when he updated his cover image, making sure everyone saw the partnership between their buddy and his favorite brew. Drinkers wanted the use of JR space because it gave them extra fame, but at the same time, they wanted to help the brand they love by promoting it to friends. JR swapped with Drinkers Daily for three weeks. In that time, the campaign reached almost 6 million unique people, jumped in page shares 352%, jumped in content likes 402%, and most importantly, fans increased by 37%. At the end of the campaign, JR's community asked that we continue swapping. So the campaign continues. So one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, especially with you know the, the James Ready, which requires obviously somebody thinking this through on how Facebook actually works and, and, and how you can build these kind of things. I mean, Crispin did a wonderful piece uh, with the Walker with the uh, Whopper uh, flame out, I think it was called, where you oh, yeah. the Whopper yeah. sacrifice. So good. And so now this role of this technologist that has to play a part in the creative team, um, like agencies like Droga5, Crispin Porter Bogusky, 72 and Sunny, they actually have that title, creative technologist, oh, yeah, yeah. as a member of their creative team, along with UX and, and mm -hmm. strategists. So how much is technology required from a new ad grad as they're getting out into the business? Like, What do you expect today from the creatives? Um, we still expect the creatives just to have great ideas right. and you know we do pair them with, like on on the creative floor we have um, you know the, the the planners we have digital planners we have uh, creative technologists we have all the digital people so you know when a team comes up with an idea like that they'll say you know this is from a team who they're not going to build it Right. You know, they go to the uh, creative tech guy, hey, is this possible for us to do it? And tech guy goes, yeah, well, you know, you just do this and this and this, okay. And then they work together to make it happen. So, for, you know, from a pure creative standpoint, we still just want great ideas. But again, you need to be curious, you need to be on Facebook and just, you know, you have to be open to those ideas. And then somebody as a team will help you figure it out. And the reverse role of that, where the creative technologist finds that we can, you know, they get this incredible discovery that, oh my God, we can do this with this piece of software, this, this yeah, interface, yeah. and goes to the creative team and says, got a client that's fit with this? Yeah, Does yeah. that happen often? Or? Oh, yeah, that happens as well. We, you know, we are um, uh, head of uh, creative technology. He, he did a presentation, um, I guess it was a couple months ago, about, you know, here's some cool things going on. Here's some, something we built. Is you know, and we're 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 testing it testing it out right now. Could we use it for a client? And so it 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 is going both ways. The dialogue's ways. happening yeah, both yeah. ways. Um, so what are the skills really needed today for somebody? I mean, a, a digital strategist, a digital planner, and even now this role of a community manager. So how? What what's the greatest skill? Of, uh, curiosity is going to be the first one. I know it will be the yes. answer. But after that, what what's really the the big skill that they need to bring to the table? Um, it depends what it is, you know, but definitely collaboration is the biggest, is the most important skill because it takes so much, so many more people to do things. You know, it isn't like, um, in the past where, you know, we're just going to make one print ad and that's what it's going to be, you know, it's going to drive you to here and here and here. And, and so the teams that we create are so much bigger. And so you really got to figure out how you're going to navigate and how you work with one another to make stuff happen. Um, which is a great way to sort of segue into a, another idea of bringing other skills to the table, mm -hmm. um, known as soft skills. Uh, one of the things that, you know, I certainly learned part of my discipline and leadership was, you know, by playing team sports and that. So how important do you look at the uh, transferable soft skills that somebody can bring uh, from their life into the team? Um, well, I think it's important on, on a few different levels. You know, we talk about uh, advertising IQ, and so it's important to have that um, high IQ when it comes to advertising and why we do it and how do you get to the solutions, but it is the EQ, what we call the emotional um, 
quotient and and it is that's the how do you work with other people you know as a leader can you get other people to follow can you uh, convince other people to join your cause and those skills are more and more important because we are working in larger groups that's right yeah um, let's go over to Matt Lee um, what's going on in the Twitterverse uh, we got a lot of tweets coming we've got tweets from uh, Las Vegas we've got uh, tweets from our former guest John Finkelstein and uh, we do have a few questions that have come in um, uh, John Finkelstein says hi, Judy. Oh, hi, John. <laughs> so uh, I really like John. I just met him recently, and I wish I'd met him a long time ago. Awesome. Um, uh, we have a few questions. Uh, one is, uh, what do you see as the most important advertising trend or opportunity at the present moment? Um, well, whatever the trend or opportunity is, that you shouldn't do it because everybody else is doing it. So awesome. you should move away from that. You know, whatever we want to do is, we want to, you know, again, we talk about wanting to be the first to do something. That's what we want to do. So you don't want to jump on the trend. We want to be the first to do something. A um, uh, key difference between Leo and other agencies, their long <clears throat> uh, relationship with their clients. How does it affect the creative and strategy, the strategies that you, uh, you develop? Um, Long-term relationships. Well, you know, I, I think it is. It's really great. I, you know, I always say that we're we're really great at marriages at Burnett. Um, you know, we're we're not great at dating. You know, we not, might not be the hottest date, like in a pitch, but we're really great in long-term relationships. And and I think that what we have the advantage of is knowing what we've done knowing the past but always pushing forward and going what are we going to do next or knowing all the problems that we needed to solve or where the opportunities are like you you get to know your clients businesses so well that um you know where to push and like in a good marriage we, you know you should always be surprising you know your your clients with something it's like hey you know what this isn't part of the brief or you didn't ask for this but you know, we're thinking this right. is a really good solve, or you know, we'd like to talk to you about this because we see there's an opportunity. And it is only until you really get to know your client's business that you can start to do that. Does that answer the question? Oh, that's an awesome answer. Okay. More questions? Yeah, no, we got Sorry. another yeah. one? Sorry. I'm just, <laughs> uh, I'm just filling out the answers here. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, great. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, uh, there is a trend in the industry uh, towards blurring the lines between uh, um, between creatives and strategists. Um, you know, copywriter, art directors. Uh, um, where did that go? Um, has uh, Lear Burnett brought in the concept of breaking down the silos? Um, there are no si there there are no silos, and I would say that. Um, you know, we have this thing at work we call One Team, One Dream, and uh, we, even, we even created a logo for it because there are no silos. We work as a team, and, and I showed this picture of an engine, and it has all these different parts and, you know, all the little lines that come off and describing what those things are, and I said, we all hold a different tool. We are all specialists at different things, but we're building one thing together, and those lines blur. Like, great ideas come from our strategists. Like, they come up with wicked ideas, and we go, yeah, let's, let's do that, but you still need the creative team to figure it out and execute, and, you know, like, they work together, and so... You know, and, and you know, our, our account people write headlines or they have ideas. They'll go, hey, you know, on a brief, you know, they might have a thought starter. And we go, that's a wicked idea. Be, yeah, yeah. It's the start of something. And so, you know, it's, it's a, I, I can't overemphasize the, the, the team build of something. Like, everybody makes the idea better. There isn't this anymore where we're, we're hiding our ideas or, you know, back off. Um, that's that's not what we do. Great. Um, we're going to start back uh, with looking at IKEA, uh, mm -hmm. a client that you've been working Great with for example. a couple of years now. And so we've got two videos we're going to look at. The first one we're going to look at is called uh, Moving Day. Mm -hmm. Every July 1st long weekend in Canada, a cultural phenomenon happens. The people of Quebec move. They call it Moving Day. This leads to all kinds of chaos. Imagine 225,000 people in a city of 1.8 million moving all at the same time. There isn't enough of anything. Trucks, movers, even boxes. This year, IKEA helped Quebecers make moving easier 
with the simple act of providing moving boxes. But not just any moving boxes, these boxes were printed with moving tips, a checklist, a helpful dinner offer at the local IKEA, and of course, it offer on new IKEA furniture for the new place. To get the boxes into the hands of the people, we created pyramids of boxes at giveaway sites at the store and around town. We printed other boxes with headlines and turned those into media. We clipped them up and people took them away. We also promoted the boxes on radio and took over the radio station so it could play music to get people moving, commercial free, on the actual day. The results? Visitors were up 14% from the same weekend the previous year, and sales went up 24.5%. That's like sales for an entire extra store. And that's a better moving day for everyone. So who brought this insight to the table or this, this, this strategy to the table. I mean, I'm married to a Francophone and you know, I just thought this piece was a ph you know, phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And you know, the phenomenon of an entire province, truly the entire it's province crazy. seems to move on yeah. one day. Yeah. I mean, if you haven't booked your van today, you're out of luck moving on the first. So right. who brought that to your attention? How, because it's, it's different than any other province. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, it, there was, the brief came in from IKEA saying, you know, we'd like to support our, our Montreal store. Um, what can we do, if, you know, in the summer? And it was, I, I think it was our planner who said, you know, there's this crazy thing that happens called moving day. It's a great time for us to get involved. You know, it, it, there's, there's people moving and so they do need to get new things. So how do we become part of their move? And um, I think originally it was going to be just a radio buy. So we came back with this idea of let's create these moving boxes. Like if you think about, we just created some cardboard boxes and you look at the sales mm -hmm. that we got, you know, and we just did it again last year because it was such a successful program. Um, we said, you know, we should do it again. This time we added a moving truck um, that was outfitted to look like a moving day box and you could tweet and have the box come to your house and deliver moving day boxes. Wow. You could follow us on Twitter or on Facebook. Because that was my question. I mean, this to, to me, you know, seeing this, the logistical nightmare of making sure that their boxes could, could get to people, that they were in the right places, mm -hmm. you know, where people were taking it down. So yeah. how big a team was involved in making sure that this all felt followed through and, you know, was it IKEA people or outsourced to? Yeah, I think we have an event company help us out, but you know, there are stations, you know, where we make sure there are boxes in, in key areas. And then last year we added the, we'll bring some to you as well. Right. Oh, that's a great piece. Mm -hmm. um, the next one is also uh, part of an opening um, which is the Rich Richmond store mm -hmm. um, video. So we're gonna play that one. IKEA was opening a new store in Richmond, BC, and they wanted us to get 10,000 people to the opening. But how do we get that many people to show up to the store on a Wednesday morning? Our solution? Coupons have been used to drive people to stores for decades, and they work. But why do they have to be paper? Why can't they be people? So we turn men, women, children, truck drivers, nail salon workers, and everyone else into coupons. Or as we like to call them, human coupons. At the opening, all you needed to bring to get up to 60% off was you. The campaign was promoted through print. We even congratulated people on the birth of their new coupons. We created non-traditional out of home with live people within the advertising itself. And we used more traditional out of home too. In the week leading up to the store's opening, we hid human coupons all over the Vancouver area. To find them, all you had to do was follow us on Twitter. Once you discovered a coupon's location, you had to hit the streets to find it. When you did, you received up to $1,000 to spend on opening day. And the more people who tweeted the IKEA Richmond hashtag, the more human coupons were released. The IKEA Richmond opening was a massive success. IKEA Richmond became a top trending topic on Twitter in Vancouver. Our Facebook fan base in Vancouver increased by 76%.
On opening day, attendance exceeded ambitious objectives by 45% and total sales smashed objectives by 42%. We even created a traffic jam. But more importantly, we put smiles on the faces of thousands and thousands of coupons that couldn't have been happier. So massively unique, uh, I mean, where does that come from and how hard is that idea to sell? Because what, you know, I mean, what I, th this, all these pieces really make me think and feel Ikea. But how hard a sell was that to the client, like to understand exactly what you meant? Oh, it was actually a really easy idea to sell. Like Ikea, they're an amazing client. Like they really, they really understand their brand so well, but they also understand creativity and the power um, creativity has to to move people and so when they saw this idea they totally got why it would work and why it would be compelling and you know all the different pieces it's just you know they're they're really wonderful to work with so it was it was an easy sell and when you see it put together you go yeah of course it's such yeah. an obvious idea yeah and it, I mean it was, it, and the newspaper pieces or the print pieces and yeah the, the out of home at all everything just fits so beautifully together and I, I love the piece where even the walking coupons you know that, yeah, you know, yeah. Little, you know, backpack sort of things. Right. So we're going to get on something a little bit tough, sort of turn up the heat a little bit on you. Um, <laughs> hot topic that has uh, always finds its way into this discussion, and I, and I know you're no stranger to this conversation uh, about women and the success, you know, their success mm -hmm. in the advertising industry. Um, I'm proud of, you know, the leadership roles in Canada. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Canada is really, you know, with yourself, Nancy Vonk, Janet uh, Keston, Christina Yu, Elizabeth Lynn, Karen Howe, I mean, it's, a, it's Suzanne Pope, the list really moves. Um, so people have difficulty with this conversation and asking the question. Neil French certainly opened a can of worms on, <laughs> on the topic. So um, Kate Gordon asked the question, where are the Donna Drapers of the world? She is the founder of something called the 3% uh, Conference mm -hmm. and has firsthand witnessed, you know, women not being given the chance to pitch, not finding their way to the top of the heap. So what are your thoughts exactly on this? And, you know, like, how, how do you approach the answer to this question? Why do I keep getting asked this question? It's because I'm a, a woman, woman, right? It is. I, yeah, that it's is why. A um, it's a tough one because I get asked this question a lot and it's really, um, it's tough because I don't think about it that way. I don't, you know, even as I was growing up in the creative department, I never thought of myself like, I don't go, oh, I'm a woman and that's why I get passed over because of this or whatever. Um, and maybe I'm naive, but I really believe that it's, it's a meritocracy. It, you know, within the creative department, it's like best idea wins, um, most talented people rise. Like it is really, I believe in that. And I haven't, I've been really fortunate to, to not run into, um, run into those things. And I, I think that there is a lot of representation of some really great women in, in Canada in leadership roles. Um, could there be more? Yeah, of course there could be more. But, you know, I think that also it, it is, um, it's tough because women, you know, it's, it, it's biological as well that, that women, you know, there's a biology to it of, yeah, if you're going to have kids, you need to take some time off. And that influences um, what happens to your career. Like, those are realities. That's, right. that's what happens. I mean, you could just have your baby and go back to work the next month. You could. Yeah. By choice. Um, by choice, and yeah. and it, it's all about choices that we make. Um, but that but could be for, said for any industry with yeah, a woman. Yeah, I guess so. And but you know, I think for me, I'm gender blind, and I'm you know, um, race racially blind, I yeah. guess. Um, so I don't really like. I never grew up and go, oh, I'm Asian. I am Asian, by the way, in case you haven't noticed. Um, <laughs> like I didn't think, oh, that's gonna that's gonna hold me back. I just, um, and again, it might be because I'm naive. I. I really believe in meritocracy. And, and that is a truth of, it is a business that's based on Hopefully, skill. Hopefully, I mean, and it might not be everywhere, but, no, but I've been in the fortunate situation of the places that I've worked at, they've been that way. And I'm not to, it's not to say that it doesn't happen in, in certain places. Tiffany Rolfe, um, 
who is a group creative director at Co in uh, New York, mm -hmm. uh, told my students this past fall when we went for a visit that women are hardwired to kick ass and nurture at the same time. So it's kind of like you know the stretch between those. Um, the advertising business is not known for its uh, nurturing and training. Um, because you know it's certainly filled with insecurities, etc. How can we change the way this industry uh, nurtures the talent within? I, I would gather things are different at Burnett because when you find somebody, you let them, you grow them. But um, yeah, that that is the training um, and nurturing is seems to be lost. It is lost in in, in a lot of um, agencies and definitely on the creative side. You see it more in account management for sure. They're more organized. You know, in account in account management, they go, "You're going to be uh, an AE, then you're going to be an AS," and there's a there's a progression, and they they teach you and they dole out information, and you grow. In the creative department, we go, "Hey, you're a good writer." We're going to throw you some projects. You know what? You're going to be a creative director now. It's like, what? You know, nobody even, I'm not ready. I haven't even been trained. Nobody even told me what I'm supposed to be doing. Right. And next thing you know, you have these accounts. And like, when I was became creative director at Burnett, it's like, OK, you're a good writer. Here's your, you're going to be creative director. And here's your department. And here's, here's your budget. And I was like, oh my god, I have budget? no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. Right. Um, but you know, there's. From a creative standpoint, we have to get better at training our people, and it is, you know, at Burnett, we're great at that, you know, the, the junior people, we never send you out. Like, you know, first time I went and made a radio commercial, I went by myself and the, and the producer. And so there I am, I'm sitting in studio, and, um, you know, with a voiceover patch, you know, our voiceover was in LA, and it was a phone patch, and he's yelling at me, and I'm thinking, God, I don't even know what I'm doing, right? And they're like, "Oh, you just push this button to talk to your talent." I, what, what am I? What do you want me to say? Like, you know, we send a, a creative director with a with a writer to the records, so it's like, okay, this is what you're going to do. You know, you know, here's how here's how to give direction. You know, there's a training. You don't you don't send them out. Is it is it a time issue over a money issue, the training? It's definitely, it requires time for sure, um, but it's an investment. Like if right. you want your people to grow and to be good, uh, you have to invest the time in doing it. Yeah, because I mean, it's, you know, you get lost on, so I, I, you know, like I know the same you're saying, it's like all of a sudden you're doing a task that you were never trained for. Oh, yeah, and you threw no that idea. word budget just, you know, like the minute I heard the word budget and quarterly report. Yeah, it's just like, here it is. I was like, oh, God. What do I do with this? Yeah, what am I going to do with that? Wow, they make that, that much? Might it's like, I don't know what to do with that. And it is, you know, there has to be a training of of, um, of people as they, as they you, know, you know, we we do reviews and we go, you know, what do you want to, what do you want to do in a year? Like, and, and creatives have to start to think about their careers more about what do I want to do? Or I'm happy doing what I'm doing, but just be conscious about it. Could, could agents, like, I, I know that a couple of uh, agencies do have annual, like, they get their talent that they see rising stars and mm -hmm. bring them in, yeah. you know, take them in and have a session with them and show them more of the ropes. Should agencies be encouraged to do more of that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the good news is, you know, I look around my classroom, um, there's a greater number of women than ever before. Yeah. Um, very smart women trying to break into the biz. Um, what conditions need to be present to guarantee some form of success. And I don't think there's a guarantee of success, but what conditions should they be trying to employ to see a form of success? Does that make any no, sense? No, that made, it no, made sense. no sense. No. At all. I mean, there's a lot, like, <laughs> great, okay, next question. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, there's, as you're training, like, what can you do as you're learning this process to, to help make sure you're finding your direction? What, like, what would you tell a young woman to look to? You mean in Mentors terms of what, or, what career they want to well, get they, into? Well, they know or, they want to work in advertising, okay. they want to be a writer, or they're going into strategy. Oh, definitely you want mentors, right. if you can get one. Everybody's really, like, the problem with agencies right now is we're so busy. Like, people are working crazy hours. But if you can get a mentor, that's amazing. If right. you can build some relationships. Like, when I was in school, I started working my first year in school. So I worked at this tiny agencies, and I wrote research papers. And, um, but it was an ad agency. Right. And so I met tons of people. So you just like, and, and once you're in the business, you're in. Right. So once you make those connections, um, people want to root for you. They want to help you out. Like there's really nice people in, in, in the business. It's just hard meeting them. Yeah. 
And there's a lot more pay forward today than there ever has been. I mean, I know like 15 years ago, um, there wasn't as much pay forward. I think that there was a different element. And now I'm seeing more people that are willing to pay forward yeah. with the young talent. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, you know, and just one other thing, when you were talking about, you know, portfolio nights, when we were talking about that, every opportunity you get to meet creative people or people in the industry or show your book, you got to go. Like, you know, like if only five people go out of 19, it's like those other 14 are not interested in being advertising. Like every time you get an opportunity, you're going to go meet somebody. You should go. So when it's knock, answer. Every time when, when there's a knock on the door, answer. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Network. Get out there. Yeah, network. We're going to look at uh, another piece, uh, the Walking Dead uh, installation at Union Station. Oh, right. Yeah. And so we'll, let's take a look at that. The Walking Dead, one of AMC's most popular TV shows, is set in a world overrun by zombies. To get people excited about its return on February 10th, we created the Rotting Finger Countdown. Every day leading up to February 10th, one finger was hacked off the hands, counting down the days to the return of the show. And for one day, we added to the rotting hands with some rotting zombies. Though we only had one installation in one Canadian train station, we amplified its impact by creating the hashtag TWDFeb10 and asked people to tweet pictures of themselves in front of the countdown for a chance to win one of the 10 two-foot-long severed fingers. As word got out, more and more people came to see the countdown. Superheroes, newlyweds, dogs, the dead, even people who couldn't make it showed up all for a chance to win a gruesome, severed zombie finger. News of the countdown quickly spread across the nation and the globe. In blogs, social media, newspapers, and the TV news. It generated over 900,000 impressions in Toronto's biggest media outlets, and over 18 million impressions on Twitter. And when the show finally returned on February 10th, the Walking Dead set a ratings record. Oh, we're back. <laughs> we're having a whole other conversation here. Sorry about that. Um, what were the logistics of that installation? Like, who needed to be part of that build? Um, certainly, you know, the media itself is, I mean, that isn't media. That's something you created mm -hmm. from scratch. Yeah. Um, I mean, how do you calculate the spend on that for the space? Um, well, that, you know, it, it was, it, it, first of all, it was a really short time frame, so we really had to do this really quickly. And it's funny, when you're building these things now, even internally, you go, who does this? Like, so you go to your print production, um, then you go to your broadcast production, and you mash them together, and you go, between, the, between these two departments, you know how to get this done. You know, from a you know, we know how to secure location spaces and, you know, what those things cost. And so, again, it's just, it's a team of people. You just go, here's, here's the answer. I need you, 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 and you. And so just make it so. Go make it, make it happen, and oh, yeah, we only have a week to do it. <laughs> <laughs> One of my students wanted to know, what was that thing made out of? Like, what was the, they didn't get It's like a paper mache thing, right. and it was, it's so beautiful. When you look at it up close, the craftsmanship is just, it's, it's unbelievable. I, I don't know what it was, like foam and a whole bunch of wood was in there. The, it was, there, it was so well done, beautiful. Was, was there a follow-up with the winners of the pieces at all, like to see like what? Uh, we sent them out, we sent them the fingers. Um, I don't know if we got their photos back yet, but we did ask them to send us a photo back. Yeah, because that was, that, I mean, that was just absolutely crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was, it was love fun. that. Yeah, I, I, I had to take Go Train, and I think it was during Ad Week, and I saw this thing like going, what the hell yeah. is, like it really was a, it took your breath away. Yeah. I mean, nice space, so. Mm -hmm. um, Matt, let's go back to Matt for uh, what's going on. But, uh, on Twitter. Yeah, we do have uh, uh, quite a few questions. Um, uh, what advice uh, does Judy have for creative directors getting the most from their teams? Um, getting the most from your team. Uh, well, that's a hard one. I mean, there's so many, <laughs> there's so many different things you have to do to get the most out of your teams, and it depends on your team, and it depends on what, you know, 
every team has their own vibe, so you're finding different ways to motivate them or different ways to help them or inspire them. And, and sometimes for a team, I'll give them thought starters or I'll send them some reference on, um, here's what I'm thinking or here's some places to start looking. Um, um, and then for other teams, it's like, you know, I could just say something as simple as, yeah, you know, it, it, it's a good, it's, it, you know, that's a merit. It's, it's, it, that's a good solid merit and that'll piss some team <laughs> off and go well that's not good enough we want it to be a goal it's like good that's the push right. um, so it depends on depends on the team but I, I try different things depends on how much help they need chair whip is that ever needed um, like how hard is it mean? to handle uh, creative people what's the um, greatest challenge in handling creative people I think, you know what, I, I think I'm pretty lucky. I think I have some really motivated teams um, and they really want to do great work. And, um, you know, sometimes I think I would say f more for new people who come into Burnett, when you come from a different agency, um, we have different systems, we have different expectations. So maybe if you're used to doing something 15 times, you don't know that we're gonna make you do it 50 times. Right. And then after we sell, sell it, we're gonna make you do it more. And then like one of the things I'm notorious for is when we sell a, a spot, for example, I'm gonna make you rewrite it even after it's sold. And then when, we re when, we're, when we're on set, I'm gonna ask you to try some things out. And maybe when we are in the recording session and the client's sitting there, I'm gonna make you rewrite it again. And, uh, you know, I'll try to get the client to agree to that version. But it's that, it's the crafting and crafting and crafting. And it's, it's, um, it's those things for new people coming into Burnett that I think is surprising. They're like, oh, okay, that's what you mean. Yeah, it ain't finished until yeah. it's perfect mm -hmm. for that. And anything else, Matt? Uh, yeah, um, we had a question regarding uh, sort of ageism in the industry as you sort of, as uh, youth comes in and older folks are sort of pushed out. Do you notice that there's a there's a sort of <laughs> <laughs> older folks being pushed out? That's such an awful image. <laughs> wow. Soil green image. <laughs> so what's the question? Sorry. Um, the question is, uh, uh, do you uh, believe that that it's an issue within the industry? Um, which I'll I'll recite it straight off the Twitter feed. Uh, you've touched on life experiences linking to broader insights. In your opinion, are there any issues with age in the industry? The only a issue with age is you just have to be relevant. You have to stay relevant. And it's funny because, you know, I was on, I was talking about this this topic with someone recently. I can't remember uh, what the context was, but you know how there are no old people in advertising and and you know in the US you see a lot more creative directors who are older and i think it is you have to be relevant and you have to stay on top of what the latest newest thing is and usually that comes from the young um, and and new people coming into the business you know they're on top of especially with technology there's so much technology and things and social platforms coming up uh, you have to stay on top of it and and care about it and it isn't like uh eh, that's for young people well as soon as you say that you're already done in advertising um so the ageism is is just you know you got to listen to music and know who's hot and just you know it's all that stuff that um you know fashion comes from and and um, entertainment is always reflecting what the latest greatest thing is and if you're not on top of it then you kind of needed to be out yeah i mean that's that's the way i've answered the question that you know like as a as a teacher and, and, and mentor in that uh, it's like staying relevant if i'm going to talk the talk i've got to walk the walk yeah yeah and so you know keeping myself relevant to the industry is critical and that's how i answer that question to people when they ask about ageism is there isn't there is no age you know age is you know it's, it's a number right it's what do you feel in your soul how do you behave what do you like how do you get motivated in, in that um i want to ask uh, or there was another question that we had uh tweeted in earlier how important are presentation skills for young ad landers as they get in like um, well, we help, we, we help young creatives with their presentation skills. Definitely when we interview someone and they seem to really be naturally articulate, that really is impressive. Right. So, you know, when you interview and they're, they're showing you their book and they're selling it and they're making sense and sounding really smart, we already think, wow, that's, that's, 
that's a well-rounded package. So um, it's not vital because, again, you know, we'll see a book that is just genius, and y you might just be the person who likes to work in the background with genius ideas. That's great too. Yeah, because you'll have somebody else that can come in. Sure, and for sure. Out of it. Mm -hmm. um, these questions might be—they're going to be short, but the answers, you know, are up to you on it. Are you competitive? Yes. How competitive, of, yeah. like you mean in, in terms of a measurement? A measurement and how, yeah. I'm super competitive and I would say that uh, there's a great, great quote um, from Moneyball, if you saw that movie, it was something like, you know, I hate to lose more than I like to win. Like I hate losing, like pitches and like, you know, I just hate losing. So I'm competitive, um, I'm competitive in that way. How do you relate com being competitive to success? Um, I think you have to be competitive. I think you have to want to win to be successful. Like otherwise, you're just like, ah, I'm pretty happy. Yeah. You know, like that's good enough. That was nice. And <laughs> good enough sucks, man. <laughs> yeah. So it, you know, you need to have that drive to want to be more. And I do have to do a shout out to David Oakley because I know that he tweeted. Um, that I did win the football pool one week in this American pool I'm in, and he still owes me a hundred bucks, and I haven't received it yet, so I did have to say that. Hundred bucks, please. A hundred bucks, <laughs> American. And uh, we're, we're keeping twenty dollars to Seneca for, you know, sure, the, the time Whatever. we've given you. Yeah, that's advertising time. We, uh, we, I did a chat with Alex Bogusky actually the same day you did a very similar chat with him down at uh, oh, yeah, the Metro that's Convention right. Center. Mm -hmm. So I had him come in and talk with a group of students and uh, one of the you know things we wanted to establish is, you know, what, what is it you need? So he said he would rather hire somebody with passion than experience. And it was kind oh, yeah. of grounded in the idea that, I, you, know, if you, you know, I can give you experience and experience will grow you, but if you don't have the passion. So what are your thoughts on passion? You know, it's funny, we look for three things. It's passion is definitely, otherwise you shouldn't even be in the business. Uh, talent is something that we look for and attitude. Those three things are a combo. Like attitude, you can't, um, you know, sometimes we, we get interns in, and I was telling you earlier, we had an intern um, who was supposed to be with us for two months, and within two days he pissed everybody off and you know, it's such a vocal group of people at Burnett, they'll come into my office and go, that dude's gotta go. And just because his attitude, he was entitled and didn't wanna, he wasn't helpful and I don't wanna do that. And it's like, he's gotta go. So attitude is really big. Um, passion, definitely, you've gotta love, you gotta love being in the business. So how could you measure that? Like, what, like what, what is a sign that you know somebody's passionate? Like, what, is there something that is a real telltale sign? There's a couple things. One is when we ask you to do something, and you can see this in the, in the different people that we can ask a task of, like, hey, can you source us some photos of dogs, for example, for a thing? And you might have somebody come back with, oh, here are the five that I found, or here, here's like 150. It's just the diligence and the, you know, that, that you wanna over deliver on everything. Yeah. That's passion. That's like, I'm going to go over and above on everything. And so that's also the pursuit of ideas of, I'm not going to show you one idea. I'm going to show you like a ton of ideas. And that's a true measure for you. Yeah. Cool. Um, has there ever been a campaign or is there a campaign, either current or past, that you kind of sit back and go, God, I wish I did that? Yeah, there's tons of them. Any one particular? <laughs> there's so many. Wow, <laughs> I didn't uh, expect to hear that. <laughs> yeah, no, of course, there's tons of stuff we see and we just go, oh, that's so smart, it's so good. Um, there's tons of them, you know, the, the, the field man you're wearing, you know, that's one of those big platform ideas that are just like, oh, it's so smart and yeah. insightful and it's not an advertising solve. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it is an advertising solve, you know, when I think about art and copy, because I'm a copywriter, I loved um, Diesel's Smart and Stupid. Right. You know, the Be Stupid was so smart and so stupid. Yeah. And I <laughs> love the tension of that. Um, you know, I love stuff like that. Um, there, there's, there's so much I could go, I can go on. Just cool. Tons of stuff. Um, as you sort of, if, you, if we, this is gonna sound morbid possibly. So you look back on your career and we're, you know, gonna I'm say. I'm dying? No. 
No, 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 no. God okay. forbid. Um, we review your career. What would be the one thing that you're most proud of, sort of maybe even on your epitaph, you know, like the, this Judy John was most proud of, so you to know, date. I always, and I say this all the time, and, it, and I write it on my self-review. This is going to be really, uh, this is going to sound really weird. I can't even believe I'm saying it out loud. But even in my own review, it says, um, you know, what do you want, what do you aspire, what do you want to um, do? And I always write, be a good human. Mm. And so um, it's beyond the advertising, but I also try to bring that in the advertising. It's just to be a good person right. um, in, what, in what I'm doing. So it's, it really isn't going to be about a single piece. It's going to be the way you've rolled in yeah, your Yeah, it's the, the way person. I behaved yeah. and the way I treated other people and the way um, I conducted myself and the type of work that we do. Um, you know, one of the things I always talk about at work is be useful. Mm -hmm. and our brands to be useful, like our advertising to be useful, like be useful in people's lives. Not, like, let's not just crank stuff out. Uh, let's be thoughtful about it. What keeps you curious? Um, I don't know, I'm just curious by nature. nature. I just love, um, you know, just what if, you know, what if we did this, what if we did that? Um, I love the possibility of right. it. That's the fun part. Is there anything you doubt? Do you have any doubts about anything? I doubt everything. You doubt everything. Yeah, I know. That's, you know, that's, <laughs> it's the way what do you, I What don't you doubt? Yeah, exactly. Like, nothing on face value. It's like, there could be more behind that. Yeah. So there's a lot yeah, behind yeah. the curtain. Yeah. Um, crystal ball time. Uh, where, I mean, it's almost impossible to ask five years, but I'm going no, to ask five can't. years. But where do you see this industry rolling um, as it rolls forward? I no mean, idea. No idea. It's no idea. Like, if you think about um, how much technology is changing, like, even... You know, you used to be able to plan five years out. Then you go, you know, and then a couple of years ago, you go, maybe we can plan three years out. Now I'm thinking, I just want to tr just, I'm planning, you know, maybe next year or 18 months. And even within that, I know that we're going to have to evolve some things and change some things. So you can't have that five-year plan anymore? You can't, no. Yeah. You try to. You'd like to. And, and you'd like to author more of it than the past where you projected, but... Yeah. Now you want to author it along the way. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that um, in looking at the future, you just have to remember who you are. And right. like for brands, like, you know, James Reddy, we remember the heart of James Reddy, even though we're going to move into other campaigns or change. And, you know, this same with IKEA. IKEA has such a strong essence of who they are, but they're going to change and they're going to do new things. Yeah, the DNA is always going to be there. It should, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if you could give this industry overall any challenge for you know, moving forward, what would that challenge be? Um, hmm. um, I don't know. Hmm. I, I, I guess it would be, you know, again, it comes back to my, my, my mantra of being useful in people's lives. Like even though we make advertising um, it should provide an entertainment or an, an informational, it, you know, we shouldn't just be creating stuff. Don't just create crap. Yeah, create like something. just don't push it out. Cool. That's what I would say. Anything else you want to close with? Any last thoughts? I mean, this has been a blast for me. I mean. Um, no, no, you know, I, it's, it's um, I, I'm really happy to be here and it's always, you know, I always want to give back and and um, try and inspire some people to want to be in advertising or stay in advertising or at least think it's a, some noble profession. So hopefully somebody thinks. Somebody got something. Some, someone got something Somebody's out of this. Right? Yes, yeah, something. <laughs> if I imparted anything, that would really help me in the being a good human part. Well, you know, Judy, this has been amazing because <laughs> I've admired you. I mean, I've admired you and your talent and, and, and the way you have worked with people. I mean, you have a number of graduates that are working at Burnett, you know, from our program. And I, you know, I see what they've evolved into as people. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that that comes from the root of having great leadership. So this for me has been a privilege, an honor um, to engage with you. And I hope we can do this again someplace down the road. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. No, thanks for having me here. And yes, I do have a lot of your students. So I will say that even though you say stuff in class and people probably think, oh, He's going to go off on that thing again. 
um, I think that you have a lot of wisdom because I have some of your students. And they're working on huh? they're And they're great. Thank you, Judy. It's been a, it's, it really has been great to have you here tonight. Thanks. Thank and we're probably going to make sure that Matt makes sure your uh, taxi is still waiting at the front oh, door. So I think he's running out the door right now. It's already taken care of. Great. So that's, that's it. That's, uh, we're going to put a wrap on episode three of uh, Seneca College's Creative Advertising TLC uh, program. We hope that we're going to continue this down the road. I would again thank Judy John, our wonderful uh, guest. It's been a privilege to uh, do some thinking, some learning, some connecting, uh, some great insights. I also want to thank uh, some other people, starting with my wonderful and very inspiring chair, Marianne Miranda, who has uh, bought into some of my harebrained schemes and ideas, and she's been a leading supporter of making sure that this series actually took place. And the entire Ad TLC program, she helped make that possible. Special thanks and shout out go to our Dean, Mark Jones, who was definitely supportive of this effort. Big thanks go to Blair Richardson and Alex Hall, the faculty of the broadcasting program here at Seneca, who has assembled an absolutely amazing team of students who worked behind the scenes to put this program together. They have made this look professional, they've made me even look somewhat professional, and God knows they've made it really uh, easy for me to look good and sound good. I also want to thank our digital masters uh, who made the series possible to connect with you online, each episode live and then ultimately archive for the future, Stephen Lynn and Adrian Klemenko. I'm sure I'm going to be leaving some folks off that thank you list, but thanks go out to them. I also want to give a special shout out to my uh, assistant and research uh, who's kept the conversation alive on Twitter, and that is uh, Matt Lee, and it would be, I'd be remiss not to say, uh, a future copywriter in this industry. My name is Anthony Calumet. It's been my pleasure to be part of all of this. I am a strong believer that we have a very bright future with the young talent that is being groomed here at Seneca and all the other colleges that are offering advertising programs. So it's Abiento or until next time. Thank you very much for watching Ad TLC.